the portrait of big brother drawn by the english writer george orwell has a permanent place in the language big brother alias joseph vissarionovich jugashvili alias joseph stalin the word stalin derives from the russian word for steel a name chosen to enhance its holder's image in the days before he had risen to power. By 1939, Stalin had become Big Brother, a man of steel in the Kremlin to forge the workers' brave new world. you turned in Stalin's Russia, Big Brother looked down on you. By the end of the 1930s, there was no escaping him. His eyes were everywhere, and a word whispered to a partner in the dark would somehow reach his ears. His power was the power of fear. Everywhere, with everyone, from the highest to the lowest, there was fear. Harrison E. Salisbury of the New York Times had first-hand experience of Stalin's Russia. Stalin stood in 1939, supreme in his own country, and apparently extraordinarily capable. But there was a difference between Stalin the man inside Russia and Stalin the man outside Russia. Inside Russia, he after all was a son of incredibly poor peasants. He came from a hard, very provincial background in Georgia. He did not know the world at large. His manipulative capabilities had eliminated his enemies, and along with it, he had developed strong paranoid traits. He suspected enemies inside his country, but when he looked beyond his frontiers, he had great difficulty in knowing whether a man was an enemy or a possible ally. And this, of course, was to betray him into an almost fatal mistake when he came to confront Hitler. Nazi-Soviet pact, signed in 1939, made allies of the two most powerful dictators in the world, who theoretically were the deadliest of enemies. Stalin got a free hand in the Baltic. Hitler was free to move west. They divided Poland between them. Nothing could illustrate better the total cynicism of the power base both men had built. In each case, it was power for power's sake. I think it's fair to assume that Stalin was astute enough and paranoid enough, certainly, not to believe that he could completely bunker Hitler. But he might be able to stave him off and turn him to the West. So each of them thought they were getting something great out of it. Totally misjudged him. He thought, he thought he'd conned Hitler. Hitler conned him. Just a couple of crooks. In the Kremlin, the Man of Steel trusted to the last minute that Hitler would not attack Russia. Before dawn on the morning of June 22, 1941, the German assault began. Although warned of Hitler's intentions by his own intelligence agents, as well as by Churchill and Roosevelt, Stalin had allowed no serious defense of his frontiers to be prepared, either for fear of provoking Hitler or for some more devious reason. His commanders dared not do anything without his authority. Finally, he gave the orders. The Red Army was to act in defense of the Soviet Union, but it was not to cross its frontiers. It was not to move into German territory without specific instructions from Moscow. 
Even at 7.15 on the morning of June 22nd, Stalin still believed and said, it may be a provocation, it may be the German generals trying to start something. He still clung to the belief that Hitler was on his side. He left that meeting and went to his dacha in the country and banged the door, and he was not heard from. For days, no one could get through to him. He called no one. No one knows what he was doing, whether he'd been drinking. It was not until the 3rd of July that he emerged and went before his people on the radio in a broadcast in which he was obviously not himself. And for the first time in his life, in his public career, he started his talk by saying, Bratia i sestra, brothers and sisters, the traditional Russian greeting. People could hardly believe their ears hearing this. But here he was appealing not to their communist feelings, not to anything but good, solid Russian nationalism. In the Baltic states and the Ukraine, the German armies were at first welcomed as liberators from the tyranny of Stalin's commissars. The Red Army offered little resistance and fell back on Moscow and Leningrad. Germany seemed able to do what it wanted with Big Brother's workers' paradise. Faced with the imminent collapse of his entire country, from which there would be no escape for himself, Stalin ordered a complete turnabout in party propaganda. Patriotism, once derided as a bourgeois sentiment, was now the order of the day, and the newsreels went to it with a will. Everything was subordinated to the task of freeing Russia from the invader military traditions of Tsarist Russia, banned by the first Soviets, were revived. Generals who had survived the Holocaust of the pre-war purges began to assert themselves over the direction of the war. Stalin brought back ranks and salutes and epaulets and medals. He invented a title for himself, Generalissimo, one that had never been used before in Russia. He gave back to the people the heroes of the past, Russians, he reminded them, were the successors of Alexander Nevsky, who led the fight against the Teutonic Knights, and of Kutuzov, the general who defeated Napoleon, names which would have cost a man his life to have uttered in the 30s. To win this war against Germany and to save his own skin, Stalin was unashamedly appealing to the spirit of pre-revolutionary Russia. The newsreels again served him well. Russia was not Russia without her church. Russian Orthodox religious worship was woven into the fabric of Russian life in a tradition which went back a thousand years to the very formation of the Slavic state. Stalin, the one-time Orthodox seminarian, knew this well. In his clumsy fashion, he had tried to build up a cult of Lenin as a substitute for the old Russian saints. Under the Soviets, the church had been deprived of all its privileges and most of its property. Thousands of priests had been killed in the purges, and only the bravest souls dared practice their religion openly. Instead, what was called scientific atheism was actively promoted, and Christianity derided in public. 
Stalin reversed Soviet anti-religious policy overnight. The League of Atheists was suppressed. Church leaders who had survived the purges were summoned to the Kremlin and told they could open up their churches again. Russia was once more to be Holy Russia. Slowly the tide of war turned. Though Russian losses were terrible, their generals, led by Marshal Zhukov, were able to assemble new divisions from the Soviet Union's vast reserves of manpower. Much needed supplies began to arrive from Britain and America. Unlike Hitler, Stalin had the good sense to leave the day-to-day -day direction of the battlefield to his professionals. He knew he could always deal with them later. After the Battle of Stalingrad, when an entire German army was forced to surrender, the war began to move inexorably in the Russians' favor. Long lines of German prisoners joined the parades laid on by Stalin for the edification of Soviet citizens. before any of them would see their homes again, those that survived the Arctic labor camps. In another piece of theater, Stalin took the salute as his victorious troops piled captured German standards at the foot of Lenin's tomb. The real loot was brought back by the train load, well away from the camera's eye, for distribution among top party bosses. Impassive as ever, the Man of Steel looked on. In public, he could afford to toast the Russian people. But even before the war's end, his secret police were busily rounding up their quota of enemies of the people. Brave officers like Alexander Solzhenitsyn among them. There was another army for whom victory brought no celebration, the army of persons displaced by a war which had ebbed and flowed across their homes, leaving them at the mercy of first one set of masters and then another. Thousands more were added to this army by the rearrangement of Europe worked out by the Allies. In Stalin's suspicious mind, these wretched men and women were all potential spies, saboteurs, counter-revolutionaries, assassins, or heaven knows what. Anyone who had been in contact with the enemy, or even worse, with the Western Allies, was judged to be contaminated by anti-Soviet bacteria. Their pitiful odyssey could only have one terminus, Siberia. The final act of the war was played out at Potsdam in Germany. The leaders of the three great powers met for the last time. In place of Roosevelt, who had recently died, there was President Truman. Churchill was on the eve of being defeated at a general election. Stalin soon found himself the only one left of the triumvirate who had decided the fate of Central Europe at Yalta. The fate of the Japanese had still to be decided. 
Potsdam, Truman had told Stalin in general terms about the atomic bomb, but Stalin had not said a word about a desperate Japanese move to get him to act as intermediary in their peace bid. After the bomb on Hiroshima, he declared war on Japan and fought a 10-day campaign to regain what Russia had lost to Japan in Tsarist times. Everything, it seemed, was now going Stalin's way. But at the same time, his paranoia appeared to be getting worse. As the years after the war rolled on, Stalin became more and more a solitary individual. He saw no one except his very small group of cronies, and with them he behaved as a total dictator, as a man who really had no consideration for any human beings. Even his family, most of whom he'd already eliminated through the purges, even his daughter seldom saw him. At night he would gather with the men in the Politburo for drinking bouts. Often he would summon them to the Kremlin at maybe 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and they'd start drinking and drink until daylight. And he delighted in making fools of them. Khrushchev, in particular, was sort of the court gesture. He would make Khrushchev dance the Ukrainian gopak. He would perpetrate crude jokes, putting tomatoes under people's seats and then laughing when, the, when Bulganin or someone sat down and made a mess of it. Suddenly, Stalin found himself big brother of virtually all continental Europe. The temptation to grab more power was irresistible. Satellite governments were quickly installed in Eastern Europe, and the Cold War spread to Northern Iran, Greece, and Turkey. In 1948, Stalin attempted to throttle Berlin, which had been jointly allocated to the four powers occupying Germany. The free world took up the challenge by supplying all Berlin's needs by air. in Berlin was that Stalin had no concept of the capability of modern air power, none whatsoever. And uh, when he announced the Berlin blockade, he felt that he had made a move that it couldn't be beat. They'd have to come to terms with him. And to his utter amazement, they didn't come to terms. They flew stuff in, and they were able to survive. I, I can't think of anything more dismaying to him. But he had no concept of that capability. In 1950, the Cold War spread to the Far East and became a hot war in Korea. But again, Stalin misjudged the situation. It happened that Soviet delegates were boycotting the United Nations, and so were not present to veto the Security Council's resolution for joint action against the Communists. I happen to think that he stimulated or encouraged the North Koreans to jump the South Koreans not because he gave a damn about Korea or the North Koreans or anybody else, but because he did give a great damn about uh, the Chinese, and he thought this was a great way of embroiling the Chinese with the United States. Now, I can't prove that, but I think that's true. Once again, however, Stalin, by following a rote, utterly misunderstood the psychology of the Americans. The recurrent crises of the Cold War fanned Stalin's paranoia. Even more so did his failure to terrorize fellow communists. The defiance of Tito in Yugoslavia and the success of Mao Zedong in China threatened his sense of power. Their hidden supporters inside the Soviet Union must all be relentlessly rooted out. And he constantly thought of things that would further secure him in his one-man rule, and he eventually began to dream even of founding a dynasty. He would be Joseph I. The only problem was, who would be Joseph II? He could not bear to think that there would be a successor to him. And it was in that kind of a mood that his final days were spent as he elaborated an, an extraordinary plot for ridding himself of all of his old associates and getting a whole new lot. Only his death, his sudden death, on March 5th, 1953 prevented him from carrying out the greatest purge of all time. Stalin's end brought to a close a life that had become fear-ridden, joyless, bleak. 
His country and its satellites suffered with him. But the people he had ruled found no release from the conditions on which his power had rested. And the system which resulted from the events of October 1917 remained. For nearly 10 years, Stalin's body lay in the mausoleum beside Lenin's. Then his heirs decided Soviet history needed revising again. Stalin's body was removed and his name chiseled off the mausoleum. His heirs had learned well from Stalin how to use his power. He was dead, but his spirit was not entirely dead. And it is of this that my friend Yevgeny Yevtushenko, the Russian poet, has written in Stalin's heirs a poem. Double and treble the sentries guarding this slab and stop Stalin from ever rising again and with Stalin, the past. By the past, I mean neglect of the people's good, the false charges and the jailing of innocent men. Stalin has not given up. He thinks he can outsmart death. We took him out of the mausoleum, but how to remove Stalin's heirs? Some of them tend roses thinking secretly that their enforced leisure will not last others even heap public abuse on stalin but at night they yearn for the good old days why care some say but i can't remain silent not while stalin's heirs walk this earth stalin still lurks beside the mausoleum